welcome to the show, guys. I have like a um, a very rare guest, an actual healthy health professional, believe it or not, uh, on the show today. I've been following him online for a little bit. And uh, before we begin, uh, Jack, one of the things I wanted to cover with you today is obviously, um, you know, there's so much research on nutrition out there, uh, so many new medical drugs being um, being made, so many new surgical procedures, et cetera, et cetera, and all this information about exercise science coming out and stuff of that sort. And the reality is, is like this information is great and everything, but I've noticed a trend that although there is so much great information coming out, the health of the population in America in general is just getting worse and worse uh, over the years. So I wanted to kind of bring up some statistics that you're probably very familiar with already, but the audience may not be. And then after listing that, I would like you to uh, just to take over and get your perspective on on what's going on and how could we could re turn the trend around, basically. So the statistics I'm referring to is uh, right now, like nine out of 10 Americans are, nine out of 10 American adults are metabolically sick. About, we have about 800,000 Americans dying from heart attacks every single year, 650,000 dying from cancer. Between those two also, uh, you know, 50% of people develop cancer within their lifetime and half of them die from it. So just as a practical vantage point, I mean, like if you go to lunch with, uh, let's say it's you and three other friends, like one friend is basically dying from a heart attack and another friend is dying from cancer. So it's like a 50% toss up, which is pretty scary if you think about it. Because a lot of times when you ask the average citizen, I'm like, oh, do you think you're gonna get a heart attack or do you think you're gonna get cancer? They'll say, no way, man. But yet they play the lottery and think they're actually gonna win that. But I'm like, there's a 50% 50 chance or greater uh, that you're gonna develop those two. And then right now, Unfortunately, we also have 125,000 Americans dying every year just from type complications from type 2 diabetes, which in my opinion is just so easy to prevent. Uh, we have about 180,000 Americans dying from strokes, um, 100,000 Americans dying from alcoholism, just as a random one, but still quite a bit of death there. You know, 33% of Americans are on some kind of psychiatric drug, as close to 80% are on some kind of pharmaceutical in general. And it depends on how you break the numbers down. But if you look at over the shutdowns, uh, last time I checked, it was like close to a million Americans died from the virus. I'm not going to mention the name here because uh, YouTube's not going to let me put on this episode. Uh, but out of those, you know, the majority of people that ended up in the hospital with complications dying from were already just very overweight and very sick. So you could easily say that 800,000 of those deaths could have been very easily preventable. Uh, as well. Even if you're not into all the data, I mean, just walk outside like anywhere in America these days, and just nine out of 10 Americans you run into literally anywhere are like full of obesity, misery, and disease. It's just very common and very acceptable. And uh, the funny thing is, is uh, especially during the shutdowns when a lot of reporters are like, oh, you know, there's so many healthy people that are dying from this virus, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, what healthy people are you talking about? And just by looking at these very basic statistics, you'll see that uh, it's just very rare to run into a healthy citizen in the U.S. And also, unfortunately, really rare. I talked uh, with Paul Check about this. Very rare just to run into a healthy health professional, which goes hand in hand because of these health professionals are uh, the leaders of our health industry, but they themselves can't make, don't even know how to make themselves healthy. How are they going to do that? Find a realistic strategy to do that with their clients. So I was just wondering if, I could get your perspective of first, like what got you into becoming a health practitioner yourself, going through medical school, your experience with the medical industry, and um, and, and the new movement you're starting as well. It's not quite new, but uh, new to me because I ran into your work just a few months ago. So, well, thank you so much, uh, Eugene, for having me on. And and those statistics you mentioned are very uh, horrifying to say the least on, on every different level. It's just so many people are sick, suffering, dying, and it's totally needless. And what you and I are going to talk about is the only strategy to avoid those things. We know that modern medicine, the, the situation is a total failure. God bless the men and women who work in emergency rooms and trauma centers, but for everything else, medicine is, is a total failure because they do not address the cause of disease. And I will say this, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, the numbers 
over the last few years from said virus. But uh, I will say no one died who was healthy. There is absolutely 0.00% mortality in healthy people. Now, you would say, well, wait a sec, I know this person, right? And they looked good and they exercised and they ate lots of oatmeal and uh, they did yoga and meditation and they still got sick and died. Well, there were those people, but I will say, ultimately, what is the judge of who's healthy and who's not? And it's more than just the physical. It also is kind of what's going on internally. And history is, is full of people who looked good on the outside, but inside they were not. And all health really stems from eat well, live well, think well. And then as people follow eat well, live well, think well, and then tests don't guess as they look for internal abnormalities, they look at things like their markers of inflammation and oxidative stress and so many other just, you know, hundreds of other factors that they would look at. That really is the arbiter of who's healthy and who's not. So whenever I hear the story about, oh, a healthy person had a heart attack, if they were healthy, they wouldn't have had the heart attack. If they were healthy, they wouldn't have got cancer. If they were truly healthy, they would not have succumbed to said virus that you mentioned. So uh, what we really want to do is we want to say, well, what, you know, what, what are the ways to truly stay healthy? And that's what my focus is at my company. And it is looking at everything through the lens of eat well, live well, think well. Um, I can jump into my story in a second, but you know, I, I want to say that the the strategy to health and wellness is only through that lens. It's not through the pharmaceuticals. That method doesn't work. Life expectancy in the United States is around 80 years of age, you know, a little bit longer for women, a little bit less for men. And that's just not good enough. That's not how we are built uh, and, and how we're designed. And, um, you know, to, to tell a little bit about me and my backstory is that I, I'm a board certified cardiologist like my father before me. I went through 10 years of medical training to become a cardiologist. And then I joined the biggest cardiology group in the state of Arizona, of which I would become a senior partner in that group. So I'm a hospital-based cardiologist by training. And then along the way, a few years into that, I would meet the woman who would eventually become my wife, to cut to that end of the story. But when I was serendipitously introduced to her, uh, we had a great conversation. And at the time, my father, who was my hero, who was a cardiologist, he was sick and dying from a rare Parkinson's-like illness. The Mayo Clinic has no idea why my father is sick and dying. And then I meet this 29-year-old chiropractor, and she tells me exactly why my father is sick and dying. And in short, uh, it's because of violations of eat well, live well, think well. And that's why my father is sick and dying. And she said, if you want to prevent the same fate as your father, if you want to uh, truly help people, which is why you went into medicine, you will also become a DC. And I said, wait a second, you want me to become a DC doctor of chiropractic? I just finished 10 years of training in order to become a cardiologist. And she said, no, not DC doctor of chiropractic, but DC doctor of cause. You have to get to the cause of why people get sick. And when you find the cause and you reverse it, that's the cure. And I was too late to save my father, but I am here to save as many other people uh, as I can. Is it tough for you to kind of, are, do you technically consider yourself as still in the medical field and still to practice like the way you're practicing now? Well, I'm definitely still a board certified cardiologist, but I practice totally different than other doctors in the sense of the, the doctors um, in the majority think pharmaceuticals first. They think surgical procedures first. I think about pharma and surgery last. So that would be one difference there. The other doctors, of course, yeah, they don't talk about uh, eating well and living well and thinking well. They uh, also tend to push the blame on genetics uh, very easily. And that's kind of our, the, the way that we're trained and that's the way you sell people on your program. Well, there's nothing you can do about it, sir or ma'am, because it's just genetics. Your, you know, you, you, your heart disease, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your cancer, it's genetic. When in reality, it's got nothing to do with genetics. Our genetics are perfect. Whoever built us, call that person God, uh, plus minus evolution, whatever we believe in, we are built perfectly. And 
what happens is when you violate eat well, live well, think well, that interplays with our genetic makeup, our DNA to, um, uh, we're, we're essentially where disease would eventually be the end outcome, we're, but we're not genetically programmed to get cancer. Like you said, uh, you know, cancer, a quarter of the population will die from cancer, quarter of the population dies from heart disease. Does that mean that half the population is genetically programmed to develop cancer or heart disease? Why would we have genetic programming that would cope for that? After all this time, again, either evolutionary, God-built combination thereof, why would we have this uh, genetic uh, destiny of to develop those? The answer is we don't. Our genetics are perfect until we screw it up with man-made uh, poisonous lifestyle. Yeah, and I find like one of the downsides of the pharmaceutical route is um, it just allows the person to keep being kind of like the dummy they were that led them into that illness. Uh, you know, the greatest uh, virus of all is just a belief system that doesn't facilitate health conscious choices. And it's also just passed on uh, kind of quote unquote genetically, you know, from father to son, et cetera, et cetera. And then it inflicts, you know, the, the organism and ends up killing the organism eventually. And I feel just by, um, you know, if you have high blood pressure, for example, okay, here, take this uh, high blood pressure medication to suppress the blood pressure. You know, a person that's somewhat naive uh, would go like, okay, so my issue is done. But the biggest thing that's missed, and I just don't know why, because I think just a lot of medical doctors are pretty intelligent overall, but they don't see like the belief system that led to the high, uh, high blood pressure. If that's not addressed, will eventually lead to a myriad of other symptoms throughout the person's lifetime. And then like, what's the only strategy that, that the patient and the doctor has just like, oh, put them on, just put them on more drugs and then on more drugs to counter the side effects of those drugs. And then kind of like I mentioned on a call with you before, uh, before this call, it's kind of like, a lot of times if you go into a doctor's office, if they did put up their before and after pictures with clients, before you'll see an overweight, overworked uh, person that's run down, and then their after picture would be an overweight, overworked person that's run down, but on medical drugs, you know, and they just, they don't look great. And obviously they're not feeling too great, et cetera, et cetera. I was just wondering like, what, why does the medical community tend to be so stubborn in regards to uh, if the best medicine of all is just changing the person that's causing the illness, why isn't the focus there? Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. I'm curious, have you ever been confused by the labels in the grocery store? In Yevgeny's book, he demystifies the difference between caged, cage-free, free-range, and pasture-raised meats. He also covers how to avoid GMOs, source high-quality water, fish, supplements, and other related topics. It's a beautifully illustrated, non-technical read that comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning materials. Jump on Amazon and check out the book titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trefkin. Now let's dive back into the podcast. Yeah, and really, it just goes back to that addition, you know, the, the original training of what the doctors uh, have. And like you said, these are highly intelligent people, but they only know what they are taught. They only are intelligent in the sense of the textbook that they read or the lecture that they heard. So when you hear lectures and read textbooks that are based on the disease model, uh, as opposed to the health model, well, then you are a disease, sickness, band-aid, cover-up, you know, physician. And that's all, of course, uh, uh, created by the pharmaceutical industry uh, that controls the medical education. But to your point, again, there it's not that they're not intelligent people. It's kind of like if um, um, if I went to, to Russia and I go there, I'm like, oh, well, none of these people speak English. They're all just stupid. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, they only know what they know. They only know Russian and I don't. So um, it's it's like if you if you would go to someone uh, right now in uh, Iran and you're trying to talk, uh, you know, religion with them and and they, they only know what they know and they only what they've been taught, just like a person in Israel only knows what they've been taught. So I think that's what what, what we're really up against. And all we can do really moving forward is to try and uh, teach the physicians teach the healthcare practitioners and teach the patients, take it directly to the populace and say, uh, you know, statin drugs are not the solution. 
High blood pressure drugs are not the solution. Uh, um, getting uh, colonoscopy and, and mammography uh, and other, you know, or, or injections, like that's not the solution. That's not the way to health and wellness. It's never, we're never going to be able to do better than how we are, you know, originally created. And the beauty of what we do is that when you address the foundation through the eat well, live well, think well, not only do you prevent heart disease and cancer, but you also prevent brain disease and you prevent autoimmune disease and gastrointestinal diseases uh, and, and succumbing to uh, said virus or bacteria or fungus or uh, you know, electromagnetic fields or surviving in a home of water damage and mold mycotoxicity. So you got to you got to just do the best that you can in that current construct. Do you get any pushback like when you do try to, you know, approach more lifestyle with clients, um, especially I, I don't know if you're uh, working with a hospital now or not, but do you get any like, oh, when you're talking to them about nutrition and lifestyle? Oh, you're you're training out of your scope of practice. You know, you should just be offering them surgeries and and drugs and stuff of that sort. Yeah, you know, it definitely that could be uh, an easy you know thing for uh, hospital administrators or or pharmaceutical companies or whatever to kind of attack. You know, the practitioner trying to leave their lane. Like, okay, well, you're a conventionally trained cardiologist. That's your lane. Well, you know, again, that's that's where a lot of my education came from. But I think that's what makes people like me very powerful is that I know their side and I know all the failures on their side. And then now I understand, you know, understand the side of common sense and mother nature, or whatever you want to look at and say, hey, you know, that's definitely uh, a better way. But we've got our work, you know, cut out for us. There's a lot of powers, you know, that be, uh, you know, against us. And even even from a patient, you know, standpoint. Uh, and I know you as, uh, you know, a, a, a um, you know, a movement professional, someone who is concerned with helping people, you know, move and and to to look and feel, you know, their best and optimizing all things from that standpoint. Um, you know, the, there there are a lot of people who who would just default and say, I don't want to do that. Like my doctor told me, all I need is this pharmaceutical, and I'm fine. Well, the doctor sold them lies, and that's uh, that's just in the medical literature because what the doctor sold them when they put them on Lipitor is that they lowered their heart attack risk from three percent to two point eight percent. That's what that's what they did according to the literature, zero point two percent. So if people are listening and they want the zero point two percent alleged benefit, well then go for that. But if you don't want to be part of the three percent or two point eight percent, if you want to be close to the zero percent heart attack risk group then you're going to join us in the way that we work but we know their side is a total failure we know our side is the correct way and that's what we'll continue to do but again you'll always find people for a whole variety of reasons why they are not able to eat well live well think well why why you know things you know get in their way and i know in talking to you and and me working with you how you know, we we really went down, you know, where you're asking questions that are really geared towards what would inhibit you from the success? Um, you know, what in your life is going on that would inhibit your ability to look and, and feel your best? And a lot of people have a lot of things going on in their lives. And not only on top of that, a lot of people are so sick for a whole variety of reasons, they can't even get their mind to a place in order to accomplish these other things. So there's a lot of different levels uh, that we have to deal with, a lot of different layers of the onion to peel back on these people. But I, I, the beauty of what we do is that it is the answer. It is the answer. And all we can really do with people is to say, here is the, here is the answer, take it. If you want it, here it is, and it'll be up to the individual to accept that or not. Yeah, and I feel, um, unfortunately, just the healthcare system in general has fallen into um, kind of the tempting model of symptom management, you know, because it's less time intensive. Uh, it's kind of like easier to understand. Uh, it provides, quote unquote, I hate this phrase, but a quick fix. Although it doesn't literally fix anything, it just creates, it fixes the thing, it gives the illusion of fixing a problem short term, just for a myriad of other problems to arise long term. But I feel like the healthcare healthcare system in general has fallen into the, uh, you know, you've kind of fallen into a swamp, and instead of figuring out how to get out of that swamp into a more healthy environment, they're figuring out like kind of how to tinker and 
move things around just to keep existing in that swamp. And I take like my grandmother, for example, I grew up uh, with her off grid in Ukraine for the first 10 years of my life. And um, honestly, she never really even learned to read her whole entire life. And I could honestly say she's far more healthy. She died at 87 without going to the doctors a single time, except to give birth to my mom. And that's it. And she died at 87, just very healthy her whole entire life. She's very functional until like the last few months of her life, was able to care for the animals, take care of the ranch, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a perfect example of like when you live in an environment that facilitates such as health naturally, how much easier it is to attain. But unfortunately, these days, because a lot of professionals may also have never lived a healthy life themselves they're in this like yes we're in this cesspool. let's not worry about getting out of it let's just worry let's just stay in it but learn how to how, maybe we can tinker this or tinker that and you know just continue to live this normalized life of pathology but fix this along the way etc cetera, etc cetera. but my saying is like dude just get out of the swamp and then the healing just happens naturally with very little insight and it's not that elaborate once you really master just living like a human being again and i feel we've stepped just as a culture so far away from that and unless we um you know make american society just more sustainable in general and conducive to health it's like it might make great money for the healthcare system because you're going to have a, so many people coming in sick and really just not resolving those symptoms but just suppressing one symptom to have another symptom come up etc cetera, etc cetera. But I was just wondering. Well, 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 well yeah, you know, certainly. I mean, like the you know the pharmaceutical industry. It's a one you know two, 2023. It's it's a 1.5 trillion dollar industry. Pfizer revenue is over 100 billion dollars for the first time ever, and 30 uh, 30 uh, billion of that uh, was was injection money. So there's just so much, so much, so much money. And I think whenever we see things around the world, uh, always with the lens of uh, you know viewing it with the lens of who stands to profit from what's going on. And every single thing in the world right now and in the history of the world, who seeks to profit, who will profit from that? Uh, and then I think also is that we should always maintain the freedom of choice over our own bodies and the freedom to question uh, and freedom of speech. So as you mentioned, we gotta be careful about what we say here so we don't get banned on, on YouTube. Uh, like that again, like that is a violation of free speech. And I think that that is, yes, yes, it's their company. Yes, it's their platform. I get that. But ultimately we always need the freedom to be able to question uh, everything. Now, as it relates to your grandmother, now, I mean, again, we are we are genetically designed to live until we're well over 100 years of age, and many, many, many people have done that. And the longevity strategy is only by following eat well, live well, think well. And, and we could also talk individually about your grandmother and say many different things about where she would have potentially violated eat well, live well, think well, the foods that she ate, the lifestyle that she led. And it sounds like, again, where you're living a relatively uh, a purish uh, farm-like existence and a very active lifestyle, you know, in, in Ukraine. Uh, and that would be a great survival strategy. But I would also look at and say, well, again, what kind of chemicals may she, you know, been exposed to uh, in and around where she was? What kind of, whether it's toxic metals, toxic pollutants, you know, radiation exposure, all those things, what, how does that impact a person? Uh, also, I would say that uh, humans uh, came from the equator. They came from the equator. Uh, they came from the Middle East. They came from uh, equatorial uh, northeastern Africa, the East Valley Rift, uh, in what is now the areas of like Ethiopia and, and Djibouti and, and Eritrea and other countries. Uh, and that's where humans came from. So we came from the equator, which means that we came from consistent sunshine. We came from uh, consistent sleep patterns. And that's where we designed to live. So when you further, when you move away from that, from that latitude, which would be obviously close to zero latitude or the zero latitude, the further latitudes we get away to the north and to the south, that's where the sickness, you know, really comes in. So uh, a lot of what I teach inside of that living well is the getting appropriate sunshine. And if you are sick in uh, Buffalo or my hometown of Chicago or uh, Portland or Seattle or Canada or Russia or Scandinavia, you, you know, you look no further than than the than the, the sunshine exposure that you're getting and how far you are away from the equator. But this is not stuff that you learn in medical school. This is not the stuff that we talk about during my three years internal medicine and three years, you know, cardiology fellowship. 
And I think what's happening too is that you know the the, the younger generation, you know, you're much younger than I am, and the younger generation uh, saw the sickness in their parents and their aunts and uncles and their grandparents, and they don't want that. They they they, they know that the pills did not help them. They uh, you know, we look around, we work hard, we want to play hard, and they look at their 50, 60, 70, 80 year old relatives who are not playing hard. They're barely able to get out of a chair or to, or to walk, you know, or or dealing with uh, you know lo low libido issues, sexual dysfunction issues. Like they don't they don't want that. They don't want that. And I think that yes, they may gravitate towards. Uh, some alternative approaches and maybe trying to hack the system from biohacking strategies. I'm a big fan of biohacking strategies, but everything has to be on the foundation of uh, and and accuse me of being guilty for repeating this over and over. But I just that that methodology that we have of eat well, live well, think well, it's the only chance for uh, vitality, clarity and longevity. Yeah, and it's totally okay to repeat that because I do the same exact thing on every show. I'm like, yes, uh, you know, using movement as medicine, you know, uh, s sleeping, getting outside, you know, having even a semi hint of purpose in your life, et cetera, et cetera. They're all easy concepts to understand. And I feel this is where people go wrong too. They're like, oh yeah, I get it. I'm like, I know you get it. And I know it's easy to understand, but are you actually doing it? You know, the majority of the week or seven days a week. And then when you ask them that way, the, the answer is no. It's like even with sleeping patterns, you ask some people, oh, how's your sleep? Oh, pretty good. And then you look at their logs. They're like, oh, going to sleep at 11 p.m. on Monday, at 2 a.m. on Tuesday, at 10 p.m. on Wednesday, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, how's your, how's your eating? Oh, it's great. Oh, how about this? Oh, oh, yeah, it was a friend's birthday. Oh, how about this? Oh, I was stressed out because of work. And you add it up during the week. It's like no one is even mastering these fundamental principles, which is why uh, the study I even quoted with the nine out of 10 American adults uh, metabolically sick right now. I mean, the standards, I'm uh, throwing a little comedy in here, but the standards were like, basically, is your heart beating? Okay, you're metabolically healthy. And like nine out of 10 uh, Americans failed even, even that test. So it's kind of like always shocking. And I feel because in American culture, mental and physical pathology has been so normalized that sick people don't even know they're sick because the person probably working next to them is just far more sick so in comparison, they're like, oh, I'm doing well. But in reality, just both subjects are a disaster overall. And I just feel that's one thing that also prevents people from seeking honest change. Because they really honestly probably think they're doing okay. I don't know if you've seen this with a lot of your patients too. Yeah, you know, most definitely. And I'll take an example of, you know, one of my best friends and he's, you know, he's like, Jack, you know, why, why are you busting my chops? You know, I'm doing better than, than pretty much all the guys we went to high school with. And I'm like, I'm not comparing you to the guys we went to high school with. I'm comparing you to you uh, and, and really becoming the best version of yourself. Uh, but the world is against us. There's, there's so much uh, going on in the world, so much stress in the world uh, that people are suffering from. And, you know, when you're under stress, you tend to read for things like alcohol uh, or illicit illegal drugs or sugar, you know, for that matter. And that's, you know, people are going to reach for something uh, and and we just have to kind of break them out of that mold also. And just the understanding that, hey, listen, you're only, you're only, uh, your next meal, um, <clears throat> you know, one, one meal away from getting back on track. So it's like, if you have a bad day, the next day you got to wake up and just have a good day, a good food day, a good physical activity, uh, activity day. I think that's all, you know, very important. So we want to give people hope that it, it really is so it, the changes. And I know you've seen this in working with your clients, the, the, the changes that can be made in a really short period of time can be dramatic. And uh, over a longer period of time, they'll be life changing. But the immediate changes can be very, very quick on, on how people start to feel like, for example, you know, if, if, if someone is struggling with uh, wheat, barley, rye and gluten and the components of that uh, and, and you get them off gluten, for example, a lot of people feel dramatically better, like very quickly. So if we get people to make those changes, but understanding, hey, listen, you know, we got you on this, uh, the accountability factor. And, and I know that's a lot of what you preach as well. Like, hey, listen, I'm going to hold your hand through this process. You got this. I'm going to be there with you. And and I think that's that's critical because. Again, the world is against us in every single way, every commercial, every fast food place, uh, our jobs, uh, our, our bosses, our, our people we associate with, everything is, you know, is, is geared against us. 
and we'll try and and break that pattern and that's where the success uh you know ultimately is going to be yeah and i feel one thing that could uh that i've seen actually help a lot of people initially even if for instance they can't work for themselves or stuff of that sort is to at least if they could with their work seek remote co uh remote work options this will help distance themselves from oftentimes a work environment that isn't sustainable is very too stressful you know most work environments are filled with a myriad of micro stresses combined with macro stresses which is the worst thing you can do for your central nervous system and like you mentioned it puts people in a myopic state and they're kind of just in survival mode day in and day out and combine that with uh, you know, like 80 plus percent of people not liking their work, that makes it even worse. You know, then you get even more agitated at your employees. They may not like their work too. Then they get agitated at you. Then you go have inflammatory, uh, you know, food, fast food or whatever uh, for lunch. That causes more stress on the body. Then you come back to work. There's another deadline. Then you get back on the freeway. You're stuck in traffic, which is actually like very tough on the central nervous system too to even drive the car. And then you get home, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't have good family life either, you know, combined with, uh, I heard Robert Kawasaki say that the average American has less than like $1,000 saved to their name. And most people don't even have that, which provides you with a lot of uh, tremendous amount of micro or macro stress. So it's just like your central nervous system is so overwhelmed. And of course, just to continue to live through that, you do have to form maladaptive behaviors. There's no other way. And then maladaptive behaviors lead to poor lifestyle and nutritional choices, which lead to weight gain and a myriad of other health issues on and on. And then of course, you know, they seek health advice and they show up at the doctor's office, get a two and a half minute assessment. Uh, here's high blood pressure medication for your blood pressure. And then you're on your way, really no follow-up either. And then, um, and then of course, how's you got it as Walensky would say, meet the problem at the level of the problem. Uh, so, of course that person isn't gonna get well or feel well, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously the less vitality you have, you know, the less you can give to your loved ones as well. So it kind of breaks apart the family unit and causes even more stress and stuff of that sort. So it's kind of like a disaster overall. And I think one thing that could help is just getting people, if they can at least work remote initially, because it would buy them about two extra hours of time to put to themselves, to have more me time, if they can't afford a coach to at least become their own mechanic, as Miguel would say. Start reading books, they're used books on Amazon for like a dollar or two. They can provide amazing information if you have the patience on tinkering and figuring out what works for yourself. And at the end of the day, you know, you'll figure out that you need a mentor eventually. And I still feel a lot of Americans could afford it, but unfortunately the average American these days is spending eight to $16,000 a year on non-essential expenses just that goes under the radar on fast food, mainly just eating out and other non-essential expenses like subscription services, uh, you know, I'm 28% body fat and I'm 50 different drugs, but I don't have money for a coach, but I definitely have money for this new iPhone coming out because for sure that's going to make me happy and, and solve all my problems. Not the case, but I always found it very interesting, especially with corporate America, how they managed to brainwash Americans into believing what's not important is most important. And what's most important is not important at all. You know, people would put, uh, sacrifice their mental and physical health for pretty much anything in this country, you know, and then wondering why they're not happy, they're full of obesity, misery, not looking their best, et cetera, et cetera. I was wondering if you kind of experienced that yourself and um, I guess how you have the patience to deal with it. Because it's almost like- Yeah, no, I mean, that's, yeah, no, that's a fantastic, you know, summary. And, uh, you know, again, I guess the patience to deal with it are just all the success stories you know that we have and that's very inspirational and knowing that you're doing the right thing uh and and that's that's very helpful but your points are fantastic especially as it relates to you know people investing uh in their health uh and you know we can take the example of how many of these same people they're uh they're going for breakfast uh at a you know let's just say starbucks you know they're going to starbucks and they have the starbucks crap of frappuccino and then they've got a you know croissant that goes with it next thing you know they're walking out of starbucks after spending 15 bucks well you know, if you look at that, that's really like, I mean, that's a five, $6,000 a year habit uh, right there when you do that, just that one little thing on a daily basis. And then you can take uh, a look at, uh, you know, some of these women, for example, and they're, you know, 65 years old and they say, well, I don't have the money for this. Well, you have the money to get your hair done, it looks like, and you have the money to get your nails done and 
uh, you know, your clothes look very nice and the car you drive looks to be, uh, you know, very nice or the home that you live in or the trip that you took. Uh, so there's always a lot of different places where people, uh, you know, could cut away from. And like you said, you know, the subscription services, right? So I, you know, I, I, I don't personally, but somebody else will say, well, I've got an account with Netflix and with Disney and with Paramount and with, uh, you know, Peacock. I mean, like, you know, they've got, they've got all this stuff that they don't need. And if they get rid of that, they'll be better. Uh, you know, most certainly. And and these other components we talk about, they're they're free, right? Sleep is uh, free. Sunshine is free. Physical activity, movement's free. You can say, okay, organic paleo food costs money. And, and that is true. And hopefully the more we invest in that over time, uh, the more the, the cost of those come down. And of course, when you're healthier, then you don't have to pay for the sickness. Uh, you know, so if you invest in your, uh, you know, yourself in those ways, I think those are all beneficial. And then back to uh, you know, what happens where, where people are at work. Well, you know, you know, years ago it was all about smoke breaks. Everybody was allowed to take their smoke breaks. Well, now go go get a sunshine break, go get a, a clean air break, go outside and go walk around your place of, of work, do some kind of movement or activity while you're in the workplace, get a standing desk, do those things. If you are, you know, um, uh, relegated to working uh, somewhere else, and again, people, you know, th there's millions and millions and millions of people who have jobs, you know, in that area where they can't work from home. But how can you, if you're a truck driver, I deal with a lot of truck drivers, how can a truck driver stay healthy on the road? Well, you know, eat the right foods, try and get the best sleep that you can, get out, walk around, walk around the truck, take walks, you know, do those things, you know, for, for activity. And then, you know, I just want to also mention that our component of think well is just as important as the eat well and the, and the live well. So when we talk about the thinking well, that in a lot of ways, I think starts off with uh, spirituality, you know, slash religion and making sure that you, uh, that you, have some kind of um, uh, uh, routine and some kind of essence that there is greater purpose, a greater you know uh, entity out there. Uh, and then number two, you can look at things like, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, purpose, uh, passion, uh, uh, as well. Like you know, what are you here for? What what are you here to do? And I think when people have that person, that purpose and passion, that it really extends into their health. And that may be something as grand as what I am trying to do is take down the cardiovascular industry of sickness and replace it with a cardiovascular health model. Or it could be something as, hey, I just want to be here to. Uh, my purpose is to be a better spouse or a better. Uh, uh, parent or a better child or a better friend like that is my purpose or I'm here to you know my purpose is to, to support animals or, or to support the planet uh, and then also the concept number three I would say is self-acceptance that self-acceptance of hey I am who I am I'm doing the best of who I am and I and I am thankful for who I am I have gratitude you know for who I am I think that's a component uh, the fourth component, and these are not necessarily in order, but, you know, this community uh, aspect of uh, do you have uh, family? Do you have friends? Do you have a community? And if you don't, you better seek out that community of like-minded people because people who are socially isolated, they die a lot earlier. So having a strong community is incredibly important. And then finally, uh, security. And you mentioned before financial security. So we're always trying to have some semblance of financial security, but also security and, and safety. Do we feel safe in our environment? Do we feel safe in our living space? Do we feel safe in our workspace? And that kind of whole methodology, I think, is something that's certainly missed in, in conventional medicine. Uh, there is nowhere to achieve that in any space with somebody with an MD after their name. Uh, the closest thing would be uh, a psychiatrist, and yet a psychiatrist is only a pharmaceutical pusher, uh, and that's all that they are. Uh, maybe you can find a holistic uh, psychologist or a social worker or other you know, coaches that would help in that arena, but again, it's, it's equally, if not more important than the food we put in our mouth or the lifestyle behaviors that we have. Yeah, and ironically for the listeners, everything Jack just mentioned is actually what real medicine looks like and will provide healing that you're seeking. And at the same time, as a bonus, you'll look your best as well, which is huge too, because I think aesthetics isn't really focused on in, in the health equation, but I think it is important because if you look your best, you do feel a lot better. Uh, I find 
I've never seen anyone's self-esteem get worse once they started looking better and their depression not lessen or their anxiety. And they also become more social uh, when they start being happy with how they look, et cetera, which has a ripple effect on other markers. Um, Jack, I know we only have about 10 minutes left or so. And once again, happy to go over and do another show uh, with you. But can you talk about any pushback you've had from the traditional cardiovascular pharmaceutical industry with what you're doing and preaching, maybe some like a text online and how you kind of deal with that and knowing, because I know what you're saying is true and what really works. And um, I don't know, it's just like mind boggling to me that people still don't take this as like real medicine. And this is what they should be prescribing in, in doctor's offices most of the time. There are no absolutes, maybe one out of every few hundred cases, you, you need a, some kind of low dose medical drug here or there. One every few hundred cases max, so that's it. But what real medicine looks like is what is what you're promoting here. But can you talk about like the, all the pushback you've had? Because I'm pretty sure um, you you have your fans online too. You know. <laughs> well, I think uh, you know. Listen, uh, when when you're doing something that's different than the norm, a lot of people are going to throw uh, you know stones at you. They're going to say things. They're going to make complaints. They'll complain to you know my medical board for stuff. You know stuff like that. But you know, I always have to take the higher ground of, you know, I know that I'm right. I know that the mission is right. I know their side. I know why they do what they do. And I know now what I, what, why I do what I do. So we always have to, you know, there's always going to be people in our lives that are coming after us, right? So, you know, you know we'll we'll try this new thing, you know, thing. oh, you're going to try that diet, you crazy, you, don't, you know, you shouldn't do that. Or I got this new physical activity routine, you know, working with uh, Eugene Trufkin and, and oh, that that's just a waste. You're not going to follow that. There's no answers, you know, with that. So there's always people in our lives that kind of, uh, you know, detract. And I look to distance myself from those people. And that goes back to my comments about how important it is to have a healthy community that are supportive and, uh, and uplifting uh, to you and to uh, if people are not supportive and uplifting to you, then you need to avoid those people. You need to get them uh, safely and efficiently and swiftly uh, out of your life. But, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of quote unquote haters that are out there that are against my message. They appear on social, they complain to boards, they go on, you know, they send emails or phone calls. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I guess we can only pray for them and, and hope that they learn the truth. Uh, someday, uh, sooner than later, not only for their own personal existence, but also for the existence of people that they encounter that are hearing that false uh, message uh, from those people. But, you know, listen, what we're doing is we're, we're tearing down the entire paradigm. We're rocking the foundation of everything that they stood for. And I talk about this in my book. I use the quote from Upton Sinclair, the jungle. And his quote is, it's hard to get a man to understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. So these medical doctors that are in the uh, pill and procedure model, that's their whole foundation. So how can you take that person and, and, and get them to accept that their version of, of medicine or health is a lie? And these are the reasons why. Now, how does a person take that? Well, now you're taking my confidence, you're taking all my training, uh, you're taking my, you know, my livelihood, uh, you're taking my professional certifications, you're putting all of that at risk. So therefore, I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. But that's what we're up against. But I think the revolution is clearly on those people who are not willing to change will be left behind. Uh, the future uh, of, of healthcare truly is uh, in this arena uh, of, of, you know, eat well, live well, think well. The race is on against medical procedures and against pharmaceuticals, you know, so you could take a look now at people and they're like, oh, well, why would I do it? You know, you know what you're saying when I could just take Ozempic or I could do some kind of injection or some kind of a procedure. Well, you can you can try those methods, but they will fail. They're not your, your science is never going to be able to outdo uh, a creative evolution. Just it's just not going to happen uh, at, at any time soon. That's for sure. Anyone who's listening here, science will never outperform nature uh, in our in our lifetime as we exist. I can't tell you, you know, 500 years from now, 5,000 years from now, you swallow this capsule and you're, you know, you're immortal. I mean, that that may happen, but uh, until that day, you better you better use the right approaches because current approaches in the medical world as, as they exist are a failure. Yeah, and I'm a, a, again a really big believer. If you want to create lasting change, you got to change the person that's creating the illness, and that's it. That's the only way it's going to happen, minus like car accidents and stuff like that, of course. 
Uh, and that's it, no shortcuts. And I think honestly, not to bag in the medical community too much, but I think they stay in business and profit a tremendous amount because honestly, a lot of people just don't want to change. And that's it, you know, and they're willing to kind of minimize the damage or, you know, patch up the holes for the time being just to buy them a little bit more time on living this unsustainable or normalized pathology type of lifestyle. So there is that aspect to it too, you know, and then the, the, the medical uh, drug dealers, I would say, is always there to help them along, you know, something that they want to do themselves. So. Yeah, well, there's a, you know, listen, there's, there's a time and a place for modern emergency medicine and trauma and stuff like that. But as we said, for everything else, you know, they're a total failure. And I, I do think that the vast majority of the population, that they are willing to make the changes, that they are willing to do uh, so, some things to improve upon their health. Uh, and we'll just continue to reach those people. There will be people who are just diametrically uh, opposed to the things that we're talking about. And hey, listen, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, good luck. Um, you know, you know, with that and, uh, you know, wish you the best. Uh, but for those who want to work with us, for those who want to, you know, embrace this stuff and invest in, in these changes, we're here to provide that forum. Cool. Well, thanks again. Thanks again for being a guest on the show, Jack. It's great to chat with you. I know we chatted for about an hour before this call, so it's really like two hours combined. But um, is there any other information or any uh, books or courses that you're offering? Um, you're welcome to list them as well. Well, for the latest and greatest from all things uh, Natural Heart Doctor, just come to our website, naturalheartdoctor.com, and we've got other doctors, and we've got a team of health coaches, and just tons of articles and blogs, not only about cardiovascular health, but stemming into many different things. And I think, again, when you address the foundation of eat well, live well, think well, as we said, it, help, it helps with everything. It's your cancer strategy. It's your heart disease strategy. It's your brain strategy, your longevity strategy, your vitality strategy. That's that. That's what we offer at Natural Heart Doctor. And again, uh, E.G. and I sincerely appreciate being on your show. Cool. Thank you. And thanks again, guys, for joining. Take care. All right, Jack. I think you're the one that's recording, so you might have to stop the the recording, and I kind of possibly email. So, me so you weren't able to record from your side. I wasn't able to record from my side. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, that was not my intention. So, let's see. I'm not too tech savvy. I'm pretty sure I could have done it. I just don't know. Usually, there's a button at the bottom, and I just press yeah. it. Yeah. I noticed when you requested to record, as I uh, pressed that, that button went away. Okay. All right. Well, I guess uh, I, if I have it, then I'll make sure you get a copy of it for your purposes. And uh, I like to grab this stuff and then I could chop it up into little pieces as well and, and you know, in turn promote the stuff you're doing. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I'll like send it over whenever you have time, well, no rush or anything. So. All right. I'm on it. Okay. All right, John. Um, and then and then let me know, you know, uh, you know, later today about how we uh, get that full payment to you. Yeah, sounds good. And then we'll schedule, I'll email you the lifestyle assessment and then we'll schedule the mechanical assessment as well. Okay. Sounds good, buddy. Okay. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you've ever had trouble losing weight or you've lost weight, but still didn't have the ideal body or health you're aiming for, please feel free to reach out anytime and book an assessment. Eugene will work with you to cover your goals in detail. See what's holding you back and go from there. In the meantime, feel free to check out the countless testimonials on Eugene's website in the link below. In the testimonial section you'll notice everyone has various backgrounds, are of all different ages, and all have had different challenges in their life, but they all have one thing in common, they were all able to find their health and achieve their ideal body. You're also welcome to add yourself to the Facebook group in the link below. There you'll have access to the live videos that Eugene does weekly on Sundays and other helpful content. Thank you again for tuning in.